Hello, uh, my name is Lewis. Um, thank you for uh, having me here to talk about my research subject. Um, I don't, everything's shuffled down a bit, but hopefully it's easily easy to read. Uh, my research mainly focuses on analysing the dimensions and weights of Iron Age textile tools from various sites along the south coast of Britain. And with this, I'm aiming to determine how textile production was organised between not only these different counties, but also uh, between different types of sites and settlements. Um, and if at all possible, um, whether the status of the textile craft itself changed within these areas. Uh, in this talk, I'm just going to present a uh, simple overview of the data. Um, so, sorry, I moved a bit forward there. Uh, this map shows the range and locations of the sites and tools included in the study. There's at least five different sites per county with more than five textile tools um, excavated from them. This was so that I could have a suitably large data set um, that could also include the range of different types of sites, so farmsteads, open settlements, uh, regional types like rounds or banjos enclosures and fortified sites as well. Uh, I wanted to work with a range of site types rather than focusing on sites spread evenly across each county um, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, different sites have different features and we know that they were used in different ways. And um, I wanted to assess what changes were visible, if any, in textile production between um, for example, a fortified uh, site like a hill fort down in Cornwall, which is this area here, versus the same in Kent. Um, and also because, quite frankly, it's very difficult to find a suitable, suitably even spread of sites in, for example, uh, Devon and Cornwall, which are these two areas here because these have very high moorlands in them and we find very few Iron Age sites in those areas. So, um, the tools I, were looking at, I was looking at are very similar to these ones here. Um, with the spindle wells, I'd be looking at the diameter of the tools, uh, the thickness and the weight. And this follows um, Margarita Gleber's 2008 work and all of these elements uh, determine how fast you can spin, uh, for how long you can spin for, and so whether the tool was uh, more practically suited for uh, spinning wool or for spinning plant fibre as well. Um, so a larger, heavier loom <coughs> weight would best suit a longer rate of spin, and so um, a longer fibre such as nettle or flax, and a faster, smaller dam sorry, a lighter, smaller diameter would best suit um, the shorter animal fibres. With the loom weights, I use methodology developed by Martinson, Anderson Strand and Nosh at the CCTR. Uh, the weight and the thickness of the tools is most important in this method. Uh, the weight determines how many warp threads can be attached for, uh, per loom weight, and the thickness determines how many loom weights can comfortably fit on a loom without pulling the warp out of shape. It is worth noting as well that um, Cornwall had completely different uh, loom weights. So this is the, the type that we usually found in Cornwall because slate and shale are extremely common in these areas, especially on the coast, um, whereas clay is slightly more difficult to reach. So they completely adapted what they were using to best suit the materials that they were finding in the area. Um, I'm also going to point out that even though we got a lot of weaving combs from um, Hampshire and Dorset being chalk, chalkland sites, there's absolutely none of them survived in uh, Devon or Cornwall outside of bog settlements. And those are so rare anyway that it just leaves huge gaps in the data. So I thought, I can't include those. So it's literally just focusing on the spindle wells and the loom weights. Uh, looking at the distribution, um, 
The southwest, southwest is always a bit strange in, um, in the Iron Age, and even to today, to be honest. And I say that as someone from Devon, so um, we're just a bit odd down there. So this is not exactly, um, I don't know, I was expecting them to be a bit odd. Um, but the first thing that you notice when looking at these is that they, although the loom weights, if you looked at the different types of sites themselves, they encompass several different forms. So fortified, um, for example, uh, number 10 is a hill fort, Blackbird Castle. Number five and number four in this, uh, number five and number three are cliff castles down in Cornwall. Um, they also had open sites, enclosed sites, spindle wells present throughout the region. But what struck me was that the loom weights were, were gathered in certain geographical areas. Um, it suggests that weaving in the southwest was, it was more about where they did it rather, as in the actual location where they did it, rather than the type of site. Um, that that they focused on, and certainly spinning was a far far more common activity than weaving was. In the so-called Central South um, area, so Dorset and Hampshire, um, it's very different. Uh, Dorset, uh, these sites here, Dorset has very different distribution. Uh, the ratio of weaving tools to spinning tools is actually remarkably similar for most of the settlements, um, suggesting that they made what they were going to use at these settlements. Uh, the one exception is Gusset Jewel Saints, number four here. Um, it had a far larger number of loom weights and the excavators working on this site uh, suggested that it was a, used as a possible um, weaver's workshop because they were found in one specific area of the site itself. Hampshire, this area here, is different again. All of the sites I studied had an overwhelming number of loom weights, except for Kennel's farm. Uh, we found a couple of weights which we thought were loom weights and when we did the uh, analysis on it, it turned out uh, to be far too heavy to suit any type of thread that could have been um, reasonably spun. Is it the Isle of Wight? Down there? Uh, yes, the Isle of Wight. So you have... So you are in Cornwall and now you go east. Yep, yeah. and now I'm, I'm moving east. So you've got Dorset here, the Isle of Wight and Hampshire moving up here. Uh, the only significant number of uh, spindle wells uh, was found from uh, Danbury Hill Fort and partly because it had a particularly um, good excavation on those sites. But overall, uh, overall, Hampshire, with, with its very few number of spinning tools and its unusually high number of weaving tools, uh, it suggests to me, at least, that uh, this region produced a greater quantity of textiles than uh, other regions. Although that doesn't necessarily mean those, te those textiles were of um, a higher standard or a better quality, simply that they produced more of them. Moving to the southeast, uh, unfortunately I could not include Sussex um, in this, in this uh, study. The Sussex sites were mainly excavated in the early 1900s and although we have several records of the excavations where they say um, a number of spindle wells were found but they don't bother telling you how many um, and they say oh it was passed off to this museum the records of where those finds have gone have since disappeared so nobody actually knows where they are which is incredibly frustrating <laughs> um, but yes moving to the southeast so this is a kent area only um, Despite the high, the high number of rescue archaeology and urban archaeology done in this area, this is a remarkably, um, remarkably few textile tools have been found from the Iron Age. Uh, most of them come from the Opta site, 
of East Weir Bay, number one here, um, which has an overwhelming number of spindle whorls and only two loom weights. Uh, even so, this gives you, an, an, again, an indication that the weaving tools were clustered in geographical areas rather than by settlement types. When it came to um, analysing the tools themselves, so this is looking at the diameter and the weight of the spindle whorls, um, this covers spindle whorls from all of the sites in all of the counties. Um, I should point out that Dorset, because it has Maiden Castle, um, Hod Hill and a number of others, um, Dorset, the yellow dots, actually hides some of the data. It, it's just overlapping quite a, quite a bit of the data there. But if we look at the overall patterns, the weights and diameters, we can get an idea of the thicknesses of the yarns produced in these different counties. Uh, the Cornish spindle whorls, what we can see of them behind all of the other dots, are actually very restricted in weight. Uh, they're between generally 5 to 10 grams, but they have a range of diameters uh, between 13 and 50 millimetres. So these are extremely lightweight. Uh, they have been able to spin very fine yarn very fa at very fast speeds, um, which would suit spinning animal fibres in particular. And compared to other counties, I would argue that these tools are aimed for an extremely specialised type of production. That they were only interested in the fine yarns, not anything else. Moving on to Devon, uh, these are slightly heavier. They range between, on average, 15 to 42 grams, with a smaller range of diameters um, between 25 and 48 millimetres. So this produces a range of yarns from fine to very thick, at fast to relatively average speeds. So they're su suited to work with a range of animal and plant fibres and could then be used to weave a variety of textiles. Uh, we see a similar pattern in the Dorset sites, although it's far more spread out. Uh, these range between the weights of 5 to 55 grams and millimetres of 26 to to 57 millimetres. Um, Hampshire sites are rather hidden behind the Dorset sites. Um, but again, very similar to the Devonshire and the Dorset weight range, between 60, sorry, between 6 to 40 grams and a diameter of 22 to 43 millimetres. And the Kent spindle whorls, far more restricted than those from the central south region, which is Dorset and Hampshire, weights between 6 to 33 grams and millimetres between 25 to 40, sorry, diameters between 25 to 45 millimetres. millimetres. So they're still able to produce thick yarns, but not nearly to the extent that the central south counties uh, were aiming to produce. <coughs> when we move on to the loom weights, we see a far greater differentiation between um, the counties. First of all, there's Cornwall doing its own little thing. Um, but when you compare the measurements from the loom weights to the spindle whorls, then you see they're actually extremely well suited for weaving with what they were producing at these sites. Uh, in general, the weights range from between five to 400 grams. Um, and when we did the when I did the, uh, the tables going through Martison's um, tabular uh, method of of working through the data, um, I found that actually they seem to suit um, weaving in an open and balanced or in warp faced fabrics. So very. Very interesting what they're doing down there, even if it is odd. Devon as well seems to be doing its own little thing. Um, the widths are extremely uh, varied, whereas the rate, weights are very restricted between 50 to 180 grams. So the weavers would have been able to work with yarns of fine to medium thicknesses to produce open or balanced textiles, but they don't seem that interested at all in dealing with the thicker um, yarns that were produced elsewhere. 
Dorset has two clusters, the smaller one of uh, 30 to 380 grams and widths of 40 to, sorry, 20 to 40 millimetres. So these could weave fine yarns uh, relatively evenly or even produce warp faced textiles. And then you have the far larger spread of between 650 and uh, 2 kilos and 80 grams and 40 to 100 millimetres. Basically, things that could weave whatever they were, they were um, dealt with. We see the similar, we see a similar thing in, uh, in Hampshire. Uh, loom weights between 850 and uh, 2 kilograms, 250, uh, 2 kilograms and 250 grams. Uh, between 58 and 119 millimetres. Kent has very few loom weights, but we could see, it's a bit of a stretch, um, but there were two clusters that were, that stood out. Um, in my study, I then separated the data by sediment type, so I could determine whether different types of sediments produce different fabrics, but I don't have nearly as much time as I need to go through um, all of this data. <laughs> so I'm just going to give you a brief slideshow. But I'm still still working through the data, still um, piecing it apart, see what what I can find. But I think we do have a number of very interesting points um, coming out of it. For a start, the restriction of different stages of textile production to the different uh, to specific geographical areas, um, either, so is that restriction indicative of specialists being in this area at these sites, or that these sites were well placed to then uh, redistribute the finished textiles from? Uh, the common dimensions of spindle wells across counties and across different sites, um, these help demonstrate a particularly a desirable type of tool or um, product of producing so type of yarn for weaving, um, which in turn will highlight sites with completely different tool dimensions, such as the whole of Cornwall. Uh, these themselves raise questions, um, such as were these were these divergent sites using different fibres or uh, producing different textiles compared to other sites? Uh, were they places of specialised craft production themselves? Um, or did that variation, is that variation simply because they were in a completely different um, time period? For example, um, they're an earlier site, whereas the other ones are far later. And I think we, we're also beginning to, um, we're also able to comment on um, the possible fibres being used and the yarns being produced, the <coughs> choices made by craftspeople regarding what tools they want in certain areas, and the possible differences in the weaving traditions or needs, such as the difference between Hampshire's abundance of uh, spindle wells, weights and sizes, and loom weights, weights and sizes, compared to Devon and Cornwall's very restricted dimensions. Yes, uh, thank you.